Shalom dear friends, wonderful to be with you and this is Israel First and we love to bring you news and interviews from the land of Israel. We know that a lot of people are praying for the peace of Jerusalem. So the program is really an opportunity for you to learn what's happening here and be connected with Israel and the people also of Israel. And today we have a wonderful uh, guest. This is Jonathan Feldstein and he's doing a great work in the land here. He's connecting also Christian and Jewish people. He, he helps also uh, for foundation for children who've been in terror acts. He's going to speak to us a bit about that. So first of all, Jonathan, thank you for coming here. Thank this you. is wonderful. And it would be wonderful if you could speak a bit how you arrive in Israel. You are a Jew from America. Sure. How the journey happened? Well, it happened long before I actually made Aliyah before the plane touched down. My father was born here, actually, that's last week. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was it would have been his 80th birthday. Uh, and he was born, and we could go into a whole interesting political conversation. He was a Palestinian Jew. And uh, my mm -hmm. father, right, my father's family uh, escaped Poland before the war. So he fortunately was born here in, in, in the did, land. Did he foresee what was going to happen? Well, I think my, my great-grandparents did. They, they were able to send out most of their children um, who either settled here or settled in New York uh, after the war and after life was very hard here in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother and her surviving siblings all moved to, or my grandmother's siblings all moved to New York because that's where they could get visas after the war and she wanted to be with them. So in the 50s, they packed up and left. And my father was a 17-year-old, not speaking a word of English, and went on to finish high school and college and get a PhD mm -hmm. and began his family and his, and his career. And, uh, but I, especially when I speak in churches, I always tell people he gave me a name that he could never pronounce because there's no TH in, English, in Hebrew. So he always called me Jonathan. And whether it was to take out the garbage or Jonathan, did you do your homework? Or Jonathan, it's time to go to bed. From, from my earliest recollections, mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a piece of Israel in it. And, and since I came here first as a teenager, mm -hmm. I knew this was a place I wanted to live. I wanted to be part of writing the pages of the Jewish future. Mm -hmm. I wanted to raise my children here. I perceived somehow as a child that it was a better place to raise children, and that's been proven in, in recent studies that in fact it is. It's a happy country, it's a great place to raise a family, and we set, I, I set that as a goal when I was an adolescent. My wife did in parallel. We met, we established a goal, we got delayed, but God put us back on track, and uh, we made Aliyah 12 and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. So we're celebrating our bar mitzvah, our bar mitzvah year in the land. Mm, wonderful. And you live in Ephrat, which is south of Jerusalem, Correct. which is in uh, Samaria, uh, sorry, Judea. Judea. The Judean Judea. mountains yeah. and, mm -hmm. and the view outside my front, uh, front door, and I never measured the distance, but we see the southern end of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And it's so important, by the way, it's a beautiful view. And people love when I post a picture of Bethlehem saw, on, on Christmas, some. right. <laughs> but it's also important every day at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. If I'm home and if the wind is blowing in the right direction, I hear church bells. Mm -hmm. And it's so important and I'm mindful, not just because it sounds pretty, but because unfortunately Bethlehem of all places in the world has become, uh, Christians have become a minority and, and in fact a persecuted minority. So that I, I'm mindful of the fact that if I ever don't hear the church bells, that, that signals danger, not just for Christians, of course for Christians, but if it's bad for Christians, it's bad for Jews. And the converse is true as well. If it's bad for Jews, it's bad for Christians. So I'm very, very mindful. I appreciate where I live. It's a biblical landscape. It's breathtaking. Um, it's a beautiful place. It is yeah. a beautiful place. Because from Tekoa, which is like a bit different, a different direction, I right. saw, I like, there is a softness, interesting yes. in the landscape. Yes, it's it's very serene, mm -hmm. and um, it's magnificent. So, so you make Aliyah. You worked here, but you work a lot in America. You've been in connection with Christian. How did it happen? Was it a long process, or was uh, it? it? It was a long process in the sense that right after I graduated college mm -hmm. in the late '80s, I went to work for the Israeli consulate in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and, and I was in my early 20s, mm -hmm. uh, certainly had a lot of background vis-a-vis -vis, 
uh, Israel and Judaism and, and other, other things that were going on in, Ju in the Jewish world at the time. And whenever the career diplomats either were too busy or didn't want to go someplace, mm -hmm. they would send me. So I would go, 22, 23-year-old kid, representing the state of Israel in Tennessee or Alabama or southern Georgia or South Carolina. And I don't remember what day or year it was. It was 1988 or 89 probably. Mm -hmm. I was sent to Cleveland, Tennessee, which I've later learned is the home of the Church of God. I didn't know that then. I didn't know that there was a Church of God. And I went to my very first Bless Israel rally. And I realized afterward it was incredible because I saw Christians dancing Israeli folk dances, singing Hebrew songs, the dressed, flags. <laughs> flags, dressed in blue and white costumes. And I was a Jewish kid from New Jersey and I'd never seen anything like that. And sometime later, I realized that's where God called me to be a bridge between Jews and Christians. And I've maintained that opportunity. First of all, it's a, it's a calling. You have to do it. If God's saying do it, it, whether you like it or not, it doesn't really matter. And he will almost bring you, if you forget a bit about it, he will bring you back in the, yeah. in the way. Yeah. And I, especially for someone like me, I'm not always so quick to pick up on, mm -hmm. on God's uh, winks and signals and, and direction for me. So sometimes I need a little re readjusting. Little push. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for me, it's been a blessing in my life. It's incredible because, because to have the privilege of having fellowship like this, mm -hmm. being invited to speak in churches and other, tr I mean, tremendous places throughout America, not only America, but predominantly, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it gives me great meaning and, it, it, and I'm privileged to do it. Um, that increased gradually since the late 80s, mm -hmm. but then over the last decade, since I was living here, then it blossomed and I, and I really was able to make an impact um, and continue to do so. Um, I, I'm always overwhelmed how many uh, websites will pick up articles that I write, that I publish first on Charisma, and then they go all over the world and I get emails from all yes, over the I world. Yes, forgot, I forgot to say right. that you're writing for Christian website and magazine. Yeah. Is what, what, a, what, a, what a personal honor for me but what a strange thing. Yet, it's a blessing, I think, that's reciprocal to have an Orthodox Jew writing for a Christian website, sharing about my life and my perspective on life here I in Israel. I think he's doing a lot of work. Of course work. it is, there's no question. <laughs> and, and, I'm th and I pinch myself sometimes thinking, why and how is it me? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's crazy, but, but again, I love it. Even if I didn't love it, I would be doing it but it makes me a better Jew, it makes me a better human being. It gives tremendous fulfillment to my life. Interesting. So how is it like with your family? How do they take it or your community? How? Uh, it's a great question. And, it, and it's a challenge that I don't fully understand yet how to deal with. My kids don't all get it completely, mm -hmm. though we bring friends home, uh, friends who I meet mm -hmm. and, and Christian friends and my kids they don't fully understand. My wife, it's a great story. Some years ago, I was contacted by a pastor from Washington State, mm -hmm. I think, Washington. And she said she wanted to come visit two days before Rosh Hashanah. So I asked my wife, of course, I'm a respectful husband, I asked my wife. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, are you kidding? My house is gonna be a mess. I'll be cooking and cleaning and I, my hair will be... <laughs> So I was respectful up until that point, and I invited the pastor and the church anyway, which she didn't like, my wife didn't like. Mm -hmm. But they visited our home, we went out to dinner, about a dozen of us, 15 mm -hmm. or so, and my wife thanked me afterward because she was so touched and inspired by the spirituality mm -hmm. of everybody who was in our house that day. She said, I'm going into Rosh Hashanah with more spirituality myself because of that experience. Isn't it interesting how it, it seems to be really something that God is doing. We are becoming a richer Christian and you are becoming richer Jews. And I love to see the res this yes. respect yes. is like, and again, he's, he's God who is doing these things in the yeah. land, which is, well, it's Well, in the, in the land and, and even, even when I'm going to mm -hmm. Texas or, or, or Florida, I was invited to speak at, um, at a, a, a Bless Israel Summit uh, mm -hmm. in Orlando mm -hmm. two months ago. And that's a privilege and it's an honor. And it's an opportunity for me 
to, to bring Israel to a wider group. Uh, I, I think to date, I'm the only Orthodox Jew who's ever spoken at the Billy Graham Library. That's crazy. This is, this is what we love to do, is like that people, because I know a lot of Christians are praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Right. And it's like, but now we want to give them, look, this is what's happening in the land. And it's, it's so important that we can connect and things are going to happen. And I mean, it's already happening, but like to see it on a bigger scale. Right. And, and no, this is wonderful. As wide as possible. And that's why this show is important and what you do in your ministry. And whether I'm writing, I'm writing an article now about the status quo in Israel and how can we continue mm -hmm. to live. And, and I've written articles recently because of uh, my perception as, as to how poorly the Obama administration has behaved in the last few weeks. And as a dual citizen, I'm an American and an Israeli. So as a dual citizen, I've, I've called, uh, called out President Obama and John Kerry. But I write about I wrote about my daughter's wedding and celebrating her wedding in the land and, and raising my children and, and just on, on, on completely random things. But I find from the responses I get that it's so enriching of other people because they don't know. Exactly. They don't know exactly. the most simple things and it just gives an added substance, substance and dimension to understanding what life is, here, uh, is like uh, here. So now in the, in, the, in the days, in your week, what are you doing about the Christian and the Jewish people? What is the concrete work that you're doing about that? Well, I'm, I'm writing all the time uh, and, and, and I always maintain contacts with my friends. Uh, recently, a lot of people have emailed me apologizing, emailed from America, apologizing for the behavior of the, of the administration. But I, I have been very fortunate to weave my calling to my profession. Uh, somebody once called it how, my, how I'm very blessed because my vocation is my avocation. And, and I'm lucky for that. And I work with the Kobe Mandel Foundation. And that's something that we've, b before I came on board, we've had a, a great deal of uh, support from Christians because the, the, the mission is very simple. So can you explain yeah. a bit? So, so the history is 15 and a half years ago, Kobe Mandel was a 13-year-old boy who went out for a hike in Tekoa, not far from our house in the Judean desert, with a friend, and they came across what's believed four or five uh, terrorists, Arab terrorists, who, who bludgeoned them to death with, with, with l large rocks and, and left them buried under the pile of rocks in a cave. And Kobe's parents, Rabbi Seth and Sherry Mandel, are, are heroic figures, biblically heroic figures in a modern day, and they established the Kobe Mandel Foundation in order to provide healing programs for families like theirs who were undergoing the trauma of losing a loved one at that point to terror. Over the years, we've helped thousands of Israelis, particularly children and particularly women, women who lost either their spouse or a child, and because there's a, though there's a uniqueness to losing someone to terror, when you're a child or when you're a single mother or not a single mother but you lose your child and you're, and you're still married, the, the, the trauma and the stress, whether you've lost that person to an act of terror or to a car accident mm -hmm. or to disease, is very similar. So the, the It's like a shock. I mean, it's death plus the shock. It's, 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 it's death plus shock plus not understanding plus questioning your faith Plus, uh, there was one other thing that I was going to add into that mix, um, and, and especially for a child growing up, a child needs to understand how to how to accommodate. My father, we were talking about him a, a little while ago. Um, my father died 20 years ago. I was an adult, much albeit a much younger adult, mm -hmm. but I still feel that loss. So imagine if somebody who's who's 10 years old grows up the rest of his life. I had a, an incredible story with a, a, a young man who's about 26 or so now, whose father was killed also in a terror attack about 20 years ago. And he said to me- So he was six? He was six. six so he, he really didn't even know his father, if you think mm -hmm. about it. He grew up all his life. And he said, I thought I was really beyond it. I thought I had, had, had established a firm foundation, but now he has a girlfriend and he's serious with his girlfriend and he's thinking about building his own future. And he said to me, now I realized I'm still missing my father. I have no one to be proud of me anymore. 
right? And that's a void. And, and if you're, and, and I think, and I don't always like to say, I don't want to overplay gender stereotypes, but if you're a woman and you lose a child, or if you're a woman, you lose your husband, you have other children at home, mm -hmm. the burden still falls on you more often than not to make sure your child is dressed for school in the morning, to make sure he or she has their, their lunch and their uh, snacks and that they're do doing their homework. And the, one of the beautiful things that the Kobe Mandel Foundation does, and Sherry Mandel uh, um, heads, mm -hmm. is a women's healing program to provide women a place that they can grieve among other women who have a, experience similar loss. So for me, it's a blessing, mm -hmm. and then it's a natural uh, connection. There's, a, a, there, there's not a challenge. Christians understand that, and unfortunately, Christians, fortunately, there's a, there's a, uh, a desire to bless Israel mm -hmm. and, and bless widows and orphans, and that's who we're talking about, mm -hmm. but also, unfortunately, in the last decade, two decades, with the rise of terrorism, yeah. people feel it more, people understand it more, and can relate. So not only are they able to help us, but we're helping reciprocally, and it's a... It's a and, and like even for them, I mean, when we see the terror in Europe and all around the world, it's like, you need to face all these questions. So sometimes it's like, it's nice to do a bit of homework before it happens, so you might be helping somebody right. who, is, who is in this kind of thing. A, a Christian friend in Florida recently proposed mm -hmm. that we should be running a program in Germany for Syrian refugees, which is fascinating, and we have the ability to do that. We don't have the money to do it, but we certainly have the ability to do that. And wouldn't that be incredible if from Israel, as the Bible says, the families of the world will be blessed through our sorrow? I, know. I can, can imagine, I mean, no, I can't imagine, but like a tiny bit of the terror they've been through, and now the children is like an old generation yes. who is going through this Correct. trauma. You know, and you have to build, you have like scars and you need to, your soul needs to be repaired and you need to know, you need to have the tools for, for doing that. Fortunately, I, other than my parents having died when I was an adult, mm -hmm. I don't understand the, the bereavement. I'm not, I'm not a bereaved person. How old were you when your dad died? 31 probably, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 31. And you know, it's, it's still loss. Mm -hmm. he, he, yeah, he's I missed. lost my dad when I was 26 right. and in a car accident, so. Yeah. It, it, it's it's you, you there's a void there will always be a void and your and and your life grow, evolves and your children grow up and they get married and they have children and you want your your uh, to show hey look yeah and when my brother wrote to me in an email yesterday how it would have been our father's 80th birthday I wrote back you know even by even that he wouldn't have been an old man he would have been much older than he was when he died but he wouldn't be an old man he'd have he'd been he'd have been blessed by 12 grandchildren mm -hmm. that he only knew three of. Uh, well, yeah, three. It, it's, there's a void that's incredible, and the fact that we can give them healing. But I, and I'm also not uh, somebody who knows much about substance abuse, but I've connected the notion of bereavement and substance abuse because people who are in recovery mm -hmm. never say that they're recovered. They always say they're, yeah. they're recovering. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the same process with bereavement, with healing whether you lose your, your father at 26 in a car accident or your father at 31 mm -hmm. from cancer, whatever it may be, there's always a, a bereavement process. Mm -hmm. It doesn't end. No, you're right. So the fact that we can provide programs that provide healing. And I think it's more difficult for children sometimes to be able to express things. Oh, of course. So it's like you need to have the right tool for them, and you are doing that with Camp Kobe. As we are, and actually yesterday I had a meeting with somebody who works with at-risk children here in Israel, and he made a beautiful comment. I wrote it down. He said, he, in all of his work, he doesn't see anything that comes close to the work that Camp Kobe does with, uh, with bereaved children or with at-risk children. Mm -hmm. He said, not even 10% close. Wow. So, so we're, we're encouraged by that. We know intuitively, we know from, uh, what's the word? Um, non-scientific research that we've done, mm -hmm. that the work is important, that the, that the impact that's made, mm -hmm. but, but it doesn't stop. Because it's not just the person, it's like the building of, of the, per, of the right. life of this person, right. which will have repercussion Correct. again on his family or Correct. her family and all of that. So friends, if you want to help, you know, the website is there and you can go and if you want to donate, when you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you say like, okay, I can do something very practical and, and it's very important. Now again, 
um, I saw that you were doing something about Christine Lurken. Can we speak just yes. a bit about that? Yes, and that's actually, a, when you said it, I got chills because it's really one of the most um, meaningful things that I've had the privilege of doing. Mm -hmm. um, Christine was an American Christian mm -hmm. who loved Israel, who was here uh, just over six years ago and was murdered by terrorists while hiking not far from here, probably a 20-minute drive from where we're sitting right now. And because she was, was an American, mm -hmm. uh, particularly an American, not because she was a Christian, so, so she's not remembered as much here. Her family, to the extent that the Israeli government provides benefits and, and help for families of terror victims, mm -hmm. her family doesn't get, not from the Israeli government, mm -hmm. not from the American government. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she's a Christian and her family is in Texas, so there's a there's a great void. Mm -hmm. And because of my work over the over the decades with Christians, I realized maybe just two months ago mm -hmm. that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility just as the the blessing Israel is a reciprocal thing. Mm -hmm. God, it, it, I always say God doesn't say bless Israel. God says I will bless those who bless Israel. Yeah, it's a it's it. a it's a formula. And so I was praying about that. And I realized we have a responsibility too. So we've established a scholarship fund for Camp Kobe in Christine's memory. It's active now on the internet. It's we're, we're over ten thousand dollars, and it's not a huge campaign. It's only forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars that we're trying to raise, and we will. Um, I'm sure you will. We, we, there's no question about it. But for me, I've been I've been finding it so touching, and and the lovely the responses that I'm getting. Again, here, we're a Jewish organization helping mostly Jewish kids and women who have, who have suffered from loss, mostly due to terror. And here we are establishing a, a permanent scholarship in, the me in memory of an American Christian who was a terror victim here. Because there is no difference. And she gave her life, her, she didn't give her life, her life was taken, she was murdered here. And I, and I think, in a sense, there's a beautiful metaphor She's, it's, it's almost as if in her memory, she's able to give hugs to Israeli kids from her grave. Which and is amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, we ha and we have that, it's a responsibility. Um, I think knowing what I know, I, don't, I didn't know Christine. Mm -hmm. I've privileged to meet her family, mm -hmm. some, of, some of them. Um, they're wonderful, wonderful people. Um, I didn't know Christine, but from what I know about her, mm -hmm. I think she'd have a huge smile on her face knowing that she's even Still after still doing yes. things in Israel, yeah, yeah. All right. And that will continue yeah. because we're helping. And you put, you you addressed this just a minute ago. Because we're helping children, mm -hmm. it's not just helping them today in 2017, yeah. but it will help them in 2000 in, in 2027 and 37 and like when they're the raising generation. their own children. Exactly. Yeah. This is beautiful. Well, thank you, thank you. That again is. You know, I'm amazed of, like, we arrived here uh, seven years ago now in Israel, and when I see the change and the things that, I mean, like, like the events and, and the connection that's happening between Jews and Christian and practical things and, and Bible studies and, you know, a lot of things is just, and it has enriched our lives. And we can, you know, it's just like, wow, it's just amazing. And uh, thank you, friends, for watching the program. Thank you for bringing life from Israel and the people can see what's happening. And uh, from me and from Jonathan, see you. And uh, we, we send you plenty of blessing from the land of Israel. Bye. Wonderful to be with you again. You see, Israel sometimes can be cold. And today I'm in, next to the fire because it's raining outside, it's really winter, and uh, this is lovely to be warm inside. So today we're looking at the letter Mem, which is the 30th letter of the Aleph Bet, and uh, it's called Mem, and there is two forms. So like the Mem is the one who is open, and the Mem Sofit, which would be at the end of uh, a word, is the Mem Sofit, which is just closed. This is interesting because there is a concept also given with the Mem, which is uh, you have the concealed and the revealed. So you see the Mem, which is closed, is the concealed, and the one, of course, open a bit is the revealed. 
and who was speaking also about the numerical value of mem, which is 40. Very interesting. 40 is like a gestation. It's like a span of time to, for a ripening process who will bring to fruition. And you see also for the gestation of a baby, a human baby is also 40 weeks. So again, you have this concept that is concealed in the womb of the mother and it will be revealed, obviously, when it will birth, when, when the birth will happen. So again, you can see how important this, this pr process that is happening. And there is many processes also that we can see in the natural world, but also in the Bible. You can see, for example, Noah, they were in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, there is another time also Isaac Moses after was uh, fasting for 40 days before receiving the Torah, giving to, the, to his people. And obviously there is the 40 years of the children of Israel uh, in the desert. Now also in the New Testament, you can see Jesus. He was fasting for 40 days before his uh, ministry. So you see there is all this, uh, this, uh, this process in, in this letter mem. So I will leave you with two words today, which is that you can learn, uh, have more vocabulary, is one is maim. Maim is water, very important. Like the baby is in the womb of his mother, maim is very important for us to be able to live. And the other one is Malchut, and Malchut is the kingdom. So I hope that you enjoy uh, the letter today, the letter Mem, and uh, see you next week. Bye. Jonathan, thank you again for coming to express what you are doing. We see the connection with Jews and Christians, and to see the light who comes again from Israel and hope. And from me and from Jonathan, we say bye and see you next week.